welcome to New Life Church. Thank you to those of you who are watching us on Facebook and on our website, mynewlifetampa.org. Today's theme is going to be redemption. It's the main theme that goes through all the way from Genesis, all the way to Revelation, is that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Even our first song we're going to sing today is, I am redeemed. And if you aren't redeemed, you need to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So we'll be starting in just a few minutes. as we get ready to start this service even before Willie prays we're going to sing a song called I'm redeemed by love divine how many know it's love divine that we're redeemed by glory glory Christ is mine give us an intro Put us 
it. He looks at us as sons and daughters and fellow servants. God is a great God. He said the enemy may come near you. Thousands may fall beside you, but it ain't coming near you. That's the hope we have. Father, we thank you today for your glory and your power, Father. You don't just have some power. You have all power. And no matter what the situation looks like or how dire the situation is, you say that there's nothing impossible with you. Now, Father, we ask that you bless your people this morning, Father, that you uplift and encourage, Father. Keep in Jesus' holy name. Bless those that say. Bless the, the preacher. Bless the singers and the musicians. Have your way in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand for the worship team.
from me. I love this song, man. I love this song. The meaning is great, the music is beautiful, so let's enjoy this. It's called More Than Amazing from Lincoln Brewster.
What a song. Powerful. That's some good guitar pick in there, too, brother. All right. Man, oh, man, oh, man. We are truly blessed, aren't we? I mean, now you're going to get a chance to bless us. Bless the church. Bless the work. Amen. Let's get ready to take up an offering. Uh, next Sunday night, I just want to announce it ahead of time, we're going to do something a little different. There's a movie um, uh, called Freedom, Sound of Freedom, and it's a two hour and 15 minute movie. It is a fantastic movie. How many of you have gone to the movie theaters and seen it? Absolutely worth seeing the second, third time. But anyway, next Sunday night, because of that, uh, being so long and we don't want to get out too late, we're actually next next Sunday night, we're going to start the service at 5 o'clock. And that way, 5, 6, 7, 15, 7, we should be done by 7.30, quarter to 8. We'll have a few songs to get right into the movie, okay? Maybe talk about it afterwards. So next Sunday night, we're going to start at 5 o'clock. Everybody got that? Make sure the drivers know we're next Sunday night. They don't start all of a sudden at 5 o'clock going, I didn't know that we were doing that. You know? Make sure they know 5 o'clock next Sunday. And uh, if you're at New Beginnings, make them serve an early uh, dinner or a late dinner, whatever. But 5 o'clock, let's all be here. It's a great movie, and uh, we'll discuss it. Amen. It's still in the movie theaters. I don't think, other than uh, the connection that Roger has with that, with that group, I don't think you can even see it online, can you? No, you can't even see it online, but we have access to it. Uh, otherwise, it's in the movie theater, and if you don't want to come Sunday night and see it, go pay 10 bucks and go to the movie theater and see it. All right? But anyway, next Sunday night. But uh, uh, let's just let's be faithful and give it time to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this offering. Bless gift and giver in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. 
about your past. Perhaps some of you should feel guilty about your past. But here's the thing. God can wipe it all out. Amen. 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 I have a little video to show you before I preach. The meaning of Christian redemption. We're going to answer that question. Everyone is in need of redemption. Our natural condition was characterized by guilt. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Christ's redemption has freed us from guilt, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The benefits of redemption include eternal life, forgiveness of sins, righteousness, freedom from the law's curse, adoption into God's family, deliverance from sin's bondage, peace with God, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. To be redeemed, then, is to be forgiven, holy, justified, free, adopted, and reconcile. You can find biblical citations on our website. See the description below. The word redeem means to buy out. The term was used specifically in reference to the purchase of a slave's freedom. The application of this term to Christ's death on the cross is quite telling. If we are redeemed, then our prior condition was one of slavery. God has purchased our freedom and we are no longer in bondage to sin or to the Old Testament law. Related to the Christian concept of redemption is the word ransom. Jesus paid the price for our release from sin and its punishment. His death was an exchange for our life. In fact, scripture is quite clear that redemption is only possible through his blood, that is, by his death. The streets of heaven will be filled with former captives who, through no merit of their own, find themselves redeemed, forgiven, and free. Slaves to sin have become saints. No wonder we will sing a new song, a song of praise to the Redeemer who was slain. We were slaves to sin, condemned to eternal separation from God. Jesus paid the price to redeem us, resulting in our freedom from slavery to sin and our rescue from the eternal consequences of that sin. That answers the question, what is the meaning of Christian redemption? Obviously, we're going to be talking about redemption today. Redemption speaks about being delivered from bondage to the payment from another. Now, I'm sure some of you have had some experience with pawn shops. There are some pawn shops in the area that I can walk in and they go, Oh, Pastor Tom, what are you missing this week? <laughs> so I do know about pawn shops probably from a different direction than some of you. Some of you have pawned some things. I've had to go get some things back out of pawn that some of, not necessarily you guys, but people who've been here in the past have, uh, have pawned. And, uh, you know, I, I even had one time my fishing poles were being sold down the street for five bucks a pop, you know. And, I still haven't quite forgiven that gentleman. 
Where is Nick? He's doing all right. We go fishing once in a while. But uh, anyway, <laughs> you remember that, don't you, Moose? Good to have you in service, Moose. That prosthetic you got on your leg looks good. You've been healing and doing good. Amen. Bless. Amen. All right. Man. But Christ, he provided our redemption, purchasing it, not with money, not with words, but he purchased it with his own blood. Amen? Amen. We've been, been removed from that slave market, never to return again. Some of you maybe today need to remi be reminded of that. You become a Christian and maybe you started to slide back in some old ways of yours. You need to be reminded that you've been redeemed from the slave market. You now have a choice. Amen. Did you know there are people out there on this street right now, probably right in front of our place, walking by in some of the houses, that they don't have a choice. They think they do. But they don't have a choice. They get up in the morning and the first thing they're thinking about is what? Where am I going to get my next hit? Where am I going to get my next drink? There's even some people I've had in our program that have told me that they were so hooked on alcohol that they had to have a beer sitting by their bedside so when they woke up in the morning they could drink that beer because they couldn't make it to the refrigerator. They had to get that beer first before they went to the refrigerator. That is the chains of sin, isn't it? There are people who are slaves to it. There are people that, 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 that just don't understand that they can be set free. Amen? But you can be set free. Amen? Amen? That doesn't mean you don't get tempted once in a while. That doesn't mean that the temptation won't come your way. But the Bible says that he will make a way of escape. Amen? Amen. When you've been covered by his blood, when you're sanctified by Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary, that, that, that you have a way of escape. God will provide you a way. The Bible promises he won't give you more than you're able to bear. Did you know that? So, oh, well, I couldn't help it. They put it in front of my face. And, no, you probably got yourself in a position to have it put in front of your face. You see, God will always give you a way out. Amen. Ephesians 1.7 says this. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You know, as I read publications, articles, and blogs today, many um, uh, cautious preachers they, um, uh, and, and pastors in regard to some particular theological terms, uh, they, they, they warn, even in some books on how to build a church, they warn against pastors using um, words around people that are, are kind of theological, words that are um, uh, Christianese, words that people don't really understand and they, they, they want you to water down the gospel and, 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 and in some sense you have to do that some to new people. But words that are used in Christianity that, that many people even in the church today don't understand and, and I think that maybe it's time to bring back some of those meanings to those words and, and make the church understand the, the meaning of words. And there's some words like eschatology. I would venture to say that probably only about 10 to 20% of the people in this audience even know what that word eschatology means. Transubstantiation, the Catholics use it. Maybe some Catholics know what it means, but most people don't know what transubstantiation means. Um, homostasis, that's a fancy word. Transfiguration, incarnation. Propitiation. There's all kinds of words that, that have so deep meanings that maybe we need to start studying those words more and learning them. But today the word is going to be redemption. Amen. Well, I agree that we must connect with the world around us if we are to reach the unsaved. I think it's a tragedy in the church today that we have dummy down the gospel so much. I, I look at it, there, there's, there's, there's a, a couple different phases of Christianity. One is a very important stage. Do you ever see an accident happen and somebody bleeding out? Who comes first? The paramedics. What do they do? They try to stabilize that person, don't they? And, 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 and their job is not to fix cancer, it's not to fix heart problems. Their, their job is to stop the bleeding, get them stabilized, and get them to the hospital, right? There's a, there's a need for that in Christianity. It's called evangelism. There, there's a need to reach people where they're at. They're bleeding. They're hurting. They're in pain, right? They're bleeding from their soul. They're bleeding from their body. They, they need help. And here, here's one problem that happens, though. In that stage of Christianity where people need help in that evangelism, 
It'd be like paramedics sitting at a at a uh, accident and the guy's arm is hanging where it's just bleeding and squirting blood everywhere and the one paramedic starts to put a tourniquet on that arm to just stop the bleeding first and the other paramedic goes wait a minute you're using a number three you need to use a number five and another paramedic on the other side says no 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 that calls for a number eight tourniquet and they argue for ten minutes while the guy's bleeding out and maybe he doesn't make it and sometimes in evangelism, we argue over nitpicky points instead of getting to the reality of it. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are blood bought. We, are, we, we, we celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection. And all other things are, are things that we need, but later, amen? amen. You see, we got to treat people where they're at. But then sometimes in Christianity, modern Christianity, we get to where all we do is the paramedic things. We, 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 we preach the gospel and, and, and we tell people they need to be redeemed. But then when it comes to the deeper things of the heart, the things that take time, the things that take study, the things that take study, a little bit of a word that some of you might not like, theology. Studying those things and the deeper things of God. Some people say, oh, I don't, I've even not heard this one. I don't need to study the Old Testament. Well, I'm a Christian in the New. And it shows how... how I was going to say ignorant, but I'm preaching here. Better be careful. How lack of information they have. How's that? The Old Testament is the Bible. The Old Testament actually shows Christ more than the New Testament. And, and you see, these are things that, that as we grow in Christ, we, nerd, we need to learn how to control our temper, don't we? We need to learn how to have character in our life. We need to learn how to deal with the, with the addictions that we've had. Sometimes those things get healed like that, and sometimes they take a period of time, don't they? Sometimes people fall, and they have to get up, and they fall, and they have to get up. But I know a Redeemer who will pick you up every time. Amen. If you let him, if you don't let the guilt and the shame set in where you, you fall and you think, ah, there's no hope for me, i got to give up. You see, fear and doubt is the opposite of faith. How about those of you who have fallen, those of you who have failed so many times that you feel you can't make it? How about you realize that faith in Jesus Christ is the way to go? He can pick you up. He can lift you up. Amen? Amen. So that first term we deal with is redemption. Set free from bondage, from the payment of another. Simply, those who have been enslaved were set free by someone else purchasing their salvation, their freedom. Simple, isn't it? Not really. But on the surface, it's simple. But how many of us should hunger and thirst after having more knowledge than this just that surface level? And we're going to just talk about the surface level today and hope that I ingrain in you, in some of you, a hunger to go past that and start studying to show yourself approved and start learning more about the Bible and eschatology and theology and all the different terms that we, we run about. We should know what those things mean. Well, here, here's three words that are in, used in the New Testament to define redemption. And I tried to learn how to pronounce these, and I can. I even went to the diction, to the internet and let them say it for me, and I still couldn't even say it back right. Agorazos. Whew, that's a rough one. It's a secular term. It has the idea of purchasing something from the marketplace. We were purchased from the marketplace of sin, weren't we? When you were out there in the world and doing your stuff and doing your crazy stuff, Christ bought you back from that marketplace that was out there. Exagorezazo. I think I'm speaking in tongues there for a minute. The secular term, it carries the idea of going into the slave market, purchasing a slave, and removing him from that arena. Removing him from that arena. Some of you accept Christ. You become redeemed. And then you don't remove yourself from the arena. Did you know that when we become free from slavery, we need to remove ourselves from some of the music we used to listen to? We need to remove ourselves from some of the friends we used to hang around? We need to remove ourselves from some of the language that we used to use? Sometimes when you become a Christian, you need to relearn how to talk. Some of you, when you're out in the world, every other word was F. F this, F that, O S. And when you become a Christian, you have to relearn those things. See, we go from being redeemed, being taken out of the market, being set free, to now 
learning how to relive our life. Some of us need to learn, some of us, because of your drug habit and addictions that you had, you learn how to manipulate people and, and, and how to get things you want by, by manipulation and, and conning people. Well, guess what? Sometimes those things you got to learn how to take care of, how to not do that anymore, how to build your character. How do you build your character? You want a couple ways? Real simple. Here's one I'm still working on. That's Sister Jenny lets me know. When you go grocery shopping and you take your cart to your car and you unload your groceries, do you leave the cart in the middle of the driveway? No. Or do you go and put it where it's supposed to go? Did you know what? That's character building. When you walk to church and you're walking out of your car and you see a cigarette butt. I can't believe somebody's in your cigarette butt all over the place. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, that should be the old view. How about you go, you know what? Somebody has an addiction and a problem here they need to deal with, but for now, I'm gonna clean this up. I've done it quite a bit. <laughs> and I don't smoke them when I pick them up. <laughs> and throw them away. Those are little things, but let me tell you something, those are things that can build your character one bite at a time. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? But the, the, that's a part, that's the, that's the aftermath. After the emergency ambulance comes and you get yourself stopped from bleeding, you get yourself maybe in a program where, you, where, you, where, where people are around you that don't have addictions, and uh, maybe there's some people around you that still have the addiction. And, uh, but you need to, instead of saying, well, they use, so I guess I will. How about you go, they use, let me help them and pray for them. See, see there's a difference of, of when you go to that next step and some of the people are stuck in the ambulance place of, of, of Christianity. When I was um, a while back here, and I'm still struggling with it, I wanted to learn Spanish. So I got some old Spanish um, tapes, you know, and I memorized some words. Very important phrase when I lived in Miami, Donde Esta El Baño? Where's the bathroom? Iglesia Church? Porto Door? Iglesia Church? Uh, window Bandana? Newspaper Periodico? I learned those words and oh wow, I just thought, I really thought I was on top of it. Till somebody in Spanish came by and said, <laughs> What did you say? <laughs> okay. And then I decided I'm really going to learn it. So I went to HCC and took a, a course in Spanish. And uh, the first couple weeks of class, we never opened the Spanish book to learn words. It was a study on the culture. It was a study learning how the Spanish, how the Spanish language came about and how all the words, except for a few words like spaghetti, all the words in the Spanish language had to be approved through Spain that it had to follow all their rules of grammar, not like English where we have several exceptions, don't we? I before E except after C and these words, either, neither, leader, C, weird, chicken, beagle. We have all these rules, except in the Spanish language, it's, it's pretty well 99% pure follows their rules, okay? And we learned that. Then we learned a little bit about culture, about how in this part of Spain they speak this way, in Miami it's a little different, the Cuban Spanish there is a little different and, and around the country. And, and we had to learn a little bit about the culture and that to understand it. Then when we opened the book, we were learning not work memorizing words. We were, mem we, we were learning how you, the noun goes before the verb and the, the different things and the, 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 the syntax is different and, and, and how the language is structured before we even started on learning the word. And I look at that and I compare that to the way a lot of people look at Christianity. A lot of people are stuck in conversational Christianity. They learn all the Christianese. They learn all the words. They learn all the things to say. Bless God, I've been redeemed. I'm saved. Are you saved? Yes, sir. And they learn the conversational Bible, but they never get into the depth of the Word of God. And you see, a lot of people, like on Wednesday night, we're starting to do that, aren't we, Brother Lee? And some people don't like it. Getting into the culture 
What made that culture believe this a certain way? Why, why did the Old Testament do this? Why did they do this? And why did Paul talk the way he talked? What was the background from it? And we learned a culture. We learned some Hebrew words and Greek words. And we learned some things. And, 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 and some people go, well, what do I need that for? I just need practical living every day. Well, we do need that too. But we need sometimes to get deeper into the word. Barnia has done a study on Christianity, and, 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 and it's sad. With all our modern day stuff, with internet, and, and, and you can look up on internet anything. I have AI on my phone, and I can ask it almost any question. Sometimes when Jenny and I are watching TV, and somebody will come on, and I'll want to know an answer. I'll press my eye and say, how old is this person? When did they die? You know, what was, and um, I did that this morning on Amazing, on uh, Blessed Assurance. I knew that Fanny Crosby wrote the poem, but I didn't know who did the words, I mean the music, so I pushed it and found out. So here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. What's amazing is on Barney's study, they found that more people back in the early 1900s and the 1800s knew more about the Bible and Christianity than the, the modern world Christianity today. That's amazing, isn't it? All that knowledge at our fingertips. It's because people are studying conversational Bibles and not getting into the deeper parts. Where's the cancer? You know, the doctor, when, when that guy in the emergency room, they bring that guy to the hospital, they start doing x-rays and CAT scans and stuff, don't they? And they try to analyze, okay, what caused this to happen? What, what inner bleedings are there? And sometimes in Christianity, we need to get more into the depth of it, don't we? We need to get in the reason why people feel the way they are, why they have PTSD about some event that happened when they were younger. Why do they get triggered all of a sudden on, on something that we don't understand? And there needs to be more of that. Amen? Yeah. Lutron, another word, means to deliver from captivity, to be set free from bondage. And actually in this passage in Ephesians, that's how that word is used. To be set free from bondage. Together, these things, they reveal uh, one is purchased. One is removed from the slave market. Together with being set free from the bondage of slavery. Who's been set free here today? Anybody? Amen. Well, stay free. Some people are set free and they choose to go back into the chains of sin. Amen. The word in this text, Lutron, it, it's not just being purchased and removed from the area of bondage, but it means to be set at liberty from that bondage. Before we get into the beauty of redemption, we must all understand our particular need for redemption. Adam was the first human created by God. He, he and his wife Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, free from sin, enjoying unhindered fellowship with God. It was a wonderful place to be. But the, through disobedience, they sinned before God and plunged the entire human race into sin, into separation from God. It, a, a perfect God, with, uh, us uh, imperfect people serving a perfect God. It created this conflict. It created this, this crisis that the world became in. Because of their sin, all are born into sin and separated from God. And the end result of that is eternal death because the, the, the results of sin, the penalty for sin is what? Death. Amen. Romans 3.23 says this, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. Clearly, all who live in life are in need. Every Christian here, every person out there, every person on that street that you pass when you leave this place and you see homeless on the street and they look like they're just like, most homeless people think they're just on top of it all. They just have an ego that you wouldn't believe. They're proud of being homeless. They're proud of what they're doing. They see themselves. You ever see these guys walking down the streets with their underwear showing? Most of them have no idea where that came from in the jails. And they walk around like, oh, man, look at my butt. <laughs> and we look at them and think, oh, God, help them. How ridiculous, right? It's like the emperor with no clothes. <laughs> they don't realize how stupid they look. And, and, and here we are. Usually people who need redemption, one of the biggest problems to overcome is getting them to realize they need it. A lot of people go, I don't need God. I'm fine just the way he is. How well was that working out for some of you who thought that in your life? 
We're all born enslaved by sin and in need one to purchase our freedom, setting us free from the bondage and the condemnation of sin. Turn that to that next slide. All right. Give that sound guy a little coffee so he doesn't fall asleep on me. All right. Number one, the plan of redemption in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the scriptures, and according to the riches of his grace. As we use this single verse for our text, we quickly discover the plan of redemption. First of all, we see the will of God. Paul was well aware that God had a plan to provide for the redemption of mankind. In order to fully appreciate and to understand uh, redemption, we must understand the will of God in this glorious and gracious process. Amen? We already settled that redemption becomes necessary with God's first creation. As Adam sinned in the garden, sin and death entered the human race. And guess what? We were born with that nature in us. You do not have to teach a baby how to lie. You don't have to teach a baby to be selfish. At 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning when it's hungry, what does it do? It doesn't care if you worked all day. It doesn't care if you're tired. It goes, ah, I want to eat now, right? When a child becomes one and a half, two years old, they don't learn to share. It doesn't come naturally. They don't learn how not to lie. It comes naturally. A, a two-year-old does not need to be taught how to lie. They have to be taught how not to lie. That's why you raise pigs, you train kids. Okay? <laughs> the truth. We are born with that nature, automatically in our nature, to be negative, to be gossipy, to be hateful, to be angry, to be liars, cheaters, stealers, all those things. It comes naturally. And, 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 and that's the blessing of someone who's raised in a Christian home where they're taught you know, how to share. They're taught those things. But some of you here weren't raised in Christian homes. You weren't taught those things when you were, well, guess what? Now you need to get out of the ambulance in the hospital and you to re, need to reevaluate your life and see the things that you weren't taught. You need to learn how to share. You need to learn how to let your ego go. You need to learn how to do those things that, that maybe you, you didn't learn out in the world. You need to get in the hospital and be analyzed. What is it that I'm missing in my life? And, and, and look in the mirror. Sometimes people want to blame God and the devil for so many things they had nothing to do with. Look in the mirror and see who's responsible for the way you are. Amen? Amen. So the will of God. God, in fact, he already knew well before Adam breathed his first breath that humanity would be plunged into sin and stand in need of a redeemer. Every one of us here today are in need of a redeemer. Amen. This plan of redemption was put into place before even the Bible says before the foundation of the world. Christ was a lamb slain in his plan before creation. Through the law, sacrifices were offered to provide limited atonement for sin. But they could not fully satisfy the righteous demands of a holy God. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. God himself would become that sacrifice. And that leads us to the work of Christ. Our redemption was made possible through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We must remember that redemption always involves a payment to be made. Now, if you don't accept Christ's payment for your sin, which is death on the cross, all right, you will pay that price later on. But the penalty for sin is death, whether you accept his death or your own death. And I'm not talking about biological death because all of us, if God doesn't come uh, quickly, uh, most of us within 100 years will all be dead. Amen? Amen? And within 200 years, nobody will even remember who you were. But spiritually, you can die spiritually after your body is dead. Amen? Amen. Price had to be paid in order to ransom one from bondage. Someone had to provide payment to liberate us out of the bondage of slavery. This was true in a, not only in a physical self, Set a physical way, the only way one captive slavery could be released was for them to be purchased from the slave market. Aren't you glad you've been purchased today? Amen. You've been purchased with his blood. We sing the song once in a while. It should make some of you, instead of just singing the song, you should be excited and not uh, running the aisles on this song. What can wash away my sins? <laughs> 
Nothing, honey. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? All the king's horsemen and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Oh, precious is the flow. There, there's a song that G.T. Haywood, one of the first, um, first leaders in the Pentecostal movement, uh, back when it wasn't wasn't popular to be Pentecost and he was a black man and he went back to his church after experiencing Azusa Street and came back and tried to preach it to his Methodist church and the church would, would said we don't want none of that you can leave and uh, G.T. Haywood wrote one of the greatest songs that we don't even hear today but he wrote it he went to his his uh, office and he prayed and, 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 and fasted for several days and came out of his office with this song I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from Calvary. Its waves, which reach the throne of God, are sweeping over me. Let me tell you something today. If you have never experienced the stream of blood flowing from Calvary, giving mercy in your life, if you've never experienced it flowing in your life, then maybe you just had the emergency surgery on the ambulance. You've never gone to the hospital and really got whole again. Some of you need to be whole again because you need to see more than just the theology of it, more than just the idea, more than just knowing that Christ died and rose from the dead. But you need to see the mercy and grace in his blood and see that blood flowing from Calvary, flowing over from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, covering your guilt, covering your shame, covering your sin, covering the stuff that you're guilty of and making you whole again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, all things are passed away. Amen. Behold, all things are become new. Doesn't always happen overnight, does it? Sometimes it takes some time. My, uh, my stepdad, when uh, he came in church, he was a retired uh, Coast Guard. And um, uh, he, was, uh, he had been in the Navy. And he was Coast Guard. And when he retired, um, he ended up... Uh, Coming to church one day, he was a he was a he was a mess. He was a bar drinking alcoholic. He was a womanizer. He had he had tattoos on his chest that I think he'd be arrested for the pornography of it. He could do things with oh never mind. Okay now. And uh when he came to church one Sunday, somebody invited him. He goes, ah, I'll come to that church. I'm only coming. Put a few tough words behind it. And he came down to the altar that night. And he gave his life to God. And what was miraculous about it was he instantly quit drinking, quit the womanizing, quit all that stuff. Still had his tattoo. About a year and a half later, he met my mom, and they got married. And I'll never forget on when he, he died. Um, actually, because he in World War II, he was uh, he was one of the ones that shoveled the coal into the uh, in, into the boilers there uh, in the ship. And a lot of those people ended up dying because of the asbestos that was there. And he, and he actually died of lung cancer, not from the smoking, but from the asbestos he had in World War II. And when, when he was on his deathbed, he asked me a very valid question, but it was, he said, when, when I get my glorified body, will I have to keep these tattoos? <laughs> I said, no, I think that probably your new body will be a little different, and you will leave those pornographic tattoos out of the way. <laughs> so, uh, but, but here's the thing. Okay, that happens once in a while where somebody instantly, God heals them of it. But in more cases than not, and I've been doing this with Jen, Sister Jenny for several, several years, this recovery stuff. And uh, a lot of times when people come down to the altar and they pray through, God gives them the, the ability and the choice to quit those things, but they still got to do it. 
God wants them to sometimes, he, it takes some time. They got to quit, they got to give up some of the old friends. They got to give up some of the ways of talking. They got to give up the, the gossipy and, and, and it ha happens a little bit at a time and the addictions, they fight and they have to go to AA meetings and NA meetings and they have to work through their, their salvation. Amen? Amen. And, and that's usually the way it works. I wish if I was God, aren't you glad I'm not? <laughs> if I was God, when somebody came down the altar and they wanted to pray through, I would instantly, and they'd be instantly healed of everything. They would they wouldn't have no desire for any of the addictions of the world, you know. And if, if I could do it, I would just cast out those demons of tobacco from all you guys who smoke. Oh, you don't like this one, huh? I would just if I was God, I would do a lot of things different than He does it. And He says, "I do it my way, you do it your way." Okay. But here's the thing: when you give your life to God. It doesn't mean you're going to mean you're going to be free from temptation. You're going to have temptations. You're going to have fears. You're going to have sometimes the old addictions will come back on you and like a wave and hit you and want you to go out and use. But here's the thing. Now you have some tools at your disposal. Now you have some ways of conquering. And some people don't understand those ways. They just go back and go back to the using. Here you got some tools, man. You got the word of God. The word of God is like a two-edged sword. Man, when that temptation comes your way, <laughs> grind it in. Sorry, Willie. Do you have the name of Jesus? What a powerful tool. God, I feel like I feel like going back on my addiction. I'm so tempted. My friend called me and says, come over, I can get it for free. Man, you can call on him. In the name of Jesus, help me to overcome this. Help me to be delivered. Instead of just going, oh, Lord. In the name of Jesus. That's a powerful name. In the name of Jesus. Hamashiach. I'm sure whatever you want to say. I'll go to him. In the name of Jesus. Set me free. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Deliver. You think that Lord's Prayer was just there by accident? Deliver us from evil. For thou art with me. Be reminded, he is with you. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And that old drug dealer calling me, asking me to come and get some. I can get it for free. In the name of Jesus, I am set free. You have, the, you have some tools at your disposal. Some of you aren't using your tools. Use the Bible. Use the Word. Jesus used it. He got tempted. He said, but as it is written, get in the Word. Let the Spirit of God touch your life. How, how many felt the presence of God here today? Well, let me explain something to you. The Spirit of God is not limited to this building here. When you're out there driving your car, you should be singing. Take the name of Jesus. This old song, none of y'all know. With you. Yeah. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Carry that spirit with you. When you feel tempted, when you feel down, when you feel discouraged. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Singing is a tool. Did you know that? Even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, sing it anyway. Hallelujah, I'm the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, I'm the glory. Revive us again. And man, that can bring you out of your funk so quick. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, we're not going to sing it, don't worry. And all he has done for me, has done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah. Oh, yeah, I guess we are going to sing it. Thank God for saving me. Here we go. Oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus. And all he has done for me. Oh, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. Now, when you get in an aggravated funk, 
and you get where you just don't know what to do and your temptation hits you and the anxieties of life hit you. How about just singing a song? Praise the Lord in the sanctuary, but praise the Lord on the street. Praise the Lord on your job. Praise the Lord wherever you are and see how those things, how Satan will flee. We sing a song once in a while. You better look out, Satan, look out. You better look out, Satan, look out. For it come to you in the name of the Lord. You better look out, Satan, look out. Yeah. I'm telling the truth here today. Amen. So let's talk about the payment for redemption. Again, the Bible says, In whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. We cannot forget that redemption always requires a payment to be made. A price had to be paid in order to ransom one from bondage. Someone had to provide payment. Aren't you glad it was Jesus? Aren't you glad that he liberated us through his precious blood? Satan has people enslaved, don't they? You know, before we started New Beginnings, Jenny and I, I used to preach sometimes about the chains of sin. I had no idea what I was talking about. All my years of theology and training and preaching. Till I got into this mess and saw what drug addiction and alcoholism can take good people and turn them into monsters. But I've also seen those monsters turn into good people again through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And I realized something, the powerfulness of addictions. You could take somebody who's been hooked on crack for a long time and take them, put them in front of you, have a guillotine here and a pile of crack here and a million dollars. This is how powerful that crack is. And if you gave that crack addict, you gave a little smell of it, let him smell it, get his trigger going, and say, okay, you have a choice. You can either wait one hour and I'll give you the million dollars. Or you could right now have all that crack you want to eat. And when you're done, I'm going to cut your head off. Did you know most crack addicts would take the crack right then? It wouldn't matter. That's why legislating morality, legislating laws don't do a whole lot of good, don't they? Do they? So many people are in jail because... The, the, the threat of jail doesn't deter them from doing what they have to do because they're hooked, they're chained to sin, amen? They're chained to the addictions, and, and, and it's powerful. And those chains are powerful, and there's only one thing that can really break those chains, and that is the power of Jesus Christ, the power of his redemptive blood, amen? It's the only thing that can really break those chains. So he paid the price, Hebrews 9.22, and almost all things are by the law purged, with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Paul declared that our redemption was secured through the blood of Christ. It was foreshadowed since the Garden of Eden. In their sin, Adam and Eve discovered their nakedness. They discovered their shame. Animals died and blood was shed to provide a covering for their sins. And in the Old Testament, sacrifices pointed towards the supreme sacrifice that Christ would pay that he willingly died in our place to purchase our redemption the holy sinless God son of God became the atoning sacrifice for our sin he shed his precious blood to appease the wrath of God and make atonement for our sins amen redemption came at a heavy price for Christ Jesus our Lord but aren't you thankful there's a song years ago we used to, he used to sing he could have called 10,000 angels but he decided to die for you and me. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says this, For as much then that you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from perdition from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. Think about that. 1 Peter 2, 24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were 
healed. Number three, the pardon through redemption. Sing a song at Calvary. Years I've spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Forgot the rest of it. Years I've spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. And it goes on. <laughs> Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen. Amen. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. For those who are saved by the grace of God, experiencing redemption in their life, there's more to life than that, though, isn't there? There's walking into the Holy of Holies. There's walking into the holy place. There's being able to feel the Shekinah glory of God in our life that gives us strength and power and gives us joy unspeakable and full of glory that gives us the peace that passes all understanding in our life. Amen? Pardon through redemption. Grace was free. The payment was paid. He bore our sins on the cross so we could be made righteous in the eyes of God. Our sins is removed as far as the east is from the west. God has shown. I did actually this week I did a little study. I love studying science. And uh, I was studying how the only place where the sun really rises from the east and sets in the west is on the equator. Every place else around the world is, is a little off of east and a little off of west. And as, as we, we get closer to the winter solstice, it becomes further away and then it starts coming back. But it's really not the east. If you look at, in the winter, if you look at the east and think that's the sun rising, it's off a little bit. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of that scripture as far as the east is from the west, right? And uh, how the, uh, the magnetic poles even... But we think that some of the things we think of in life and take for granted aren't so true. I was telling Jenny this morning, I was giving her a science lesson this morning, that the north is really not north, the north is south. How many of y'all knew that? Huh. Yeah, one person knew that. When a needle points north, that's, that's the positive end, but it faces the negative end of the North Pole, which is really the negative, that's the South Pole, but we call it the North Pole. If you take a magnet and put it next to a, a compass, you take the, the positive side, it will not go, you take the negative side, it will draw towards it. Actually, North is really South, and South is really North. And then Jenny's looking at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and the, mag you know, the magnetic, uh, the magnetic, um, North Pole is separate from the geographical North Pole, and, and actually the, the magnetic North Pole travels 50, uh, 50 miles a day, it travels away from the pole, it comes this way, and, and it goes away where the magnetic, right now the magnetic um, pole is just about even with the North Pole, but then as time goes on, in another week or two it'll be far away, and then our, our GPSs that I have on, on the boat, they actually compensate for it computer-wise and compensate and make it be a true geological north, even though the magnetic, oh, I'll forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me off on all. Yeah. Well, I guess where I got on that kick was this week I had a, a HCC student call me who was taking some courses in theology and she let me know right off she wasn't a Christian. She said, my family's Christian, but I can't believe it the way they believe it. And she asked me a lot of hard questions. She asked me about science and how science uh, conflicts with the Bible. And I said, no, it doesn't. And she goes, huh? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I explained how science does not conflict with the Bible. Good science supports good Bible, and good Bible information supports good science. And we went on and on. And she said, wow, I've never heard it said that way. I said, well, well Rita, you were in the room with her. And... Um, she says, well, that seems to make a lot more sense than I've ever heard it before. But that's how I got in this science kick this week. But anyway, the provision for redemption. We have a provision. It's called Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And she asked me a question too. What is the difference between Christianity and all the other religions? And, 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 and my answer kind of took her by surprise. She says, well, a lot of the other religions are very good. There are Muslims who live very good life. Most Muslims live a good life. There's a few terrorists in the group that give them all a bad name. I said, there's some good Buddhists who live good life and, and they do well. 
And uh, there, there are some Christians who do well, and then there's some bad Christians who give them a bad name also, right? I said, she said, well, well then what's the difference? I said, the difference is Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And it's all about his resurrection with Christianity. It's not just about living a good life. All that's good and important and fine, but it's about being redeemed because no matter how good a life we live, we are we are we fall short of the glory of God. We fall short in our sin. And only the redemptive power of Jesus Christ through the resurrection can we have life in him. Amen. And I said, that's the difference. Christianity has a risen savior. The other religions just have a lot of good sayings. And some good stuff. I've read some Socrates. I've read some Plato. There's some good stuff they got in there. Even the teachings of Jesus wasn't that good. Oh, that's going to get me blasphemy. No, most of his teachings in the Bible, a lot of it came from Greek philosophy. It's not the teachings of Christ that's, that's so wonderful. It's not the fact that he did miracles and healings. Did you know that there were other leaders in other religions that do healings and miracles? Oh, I'm getting too deep for y'all. I need to get back out of this. Huh? What is it that makes Christianity different? It's the fact that our Savior gave his life and was buried and rose from the dead and now lives in us. Amen? That's the difference. Amen? 2 Corinthians 8 9 says this, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That wasn't talking about money. That was talking about spiritually. He divested himself. That ye through his poverty might be rich. How are we rich? I keep referring to songs. But there's a song years ago, an old country hit song. I'm a poor rich man. Yeah. The only way you can sing that song, country music, is with a clothespin on your nose. I'm a poor rich man. You know, those old songs they used to sing with a clothespin on their nose or something. What does that mean, I'm a poor rich man? It meant that I might be poor in money and worldly possessions, but there's something I'm rich in, and that is the grace of Jesus Christ makes us rich, amen? That we are children of the king. Whether we know it or not, we're children of the king, and we have an inheritance of riches of heaven, amen? The year was 1829. There was a man by the name of George Wilson. He was tried, and he was convicted of murder and, and mail fraud, and... Uh, he was sentenced to death. And because his family was well-known and, and, and very influential, his family made an appeal to the president, President Andrew Jackson, to uh, exonerate him, to pardon him. And after Andrew Jackson reviewed all of the um, facts of the case, I think it became more the fact that the family that was influential and probably behind his campaign, but that's another story. Um, he decided to issue a pardon for George Wilson. And uh, this presidential pardon, they, they brought it into George Wilson in his jail cell and says, guess what? The, the president has pardoned you. And they thought he'd be all excited and George says, no, wait a minute. I'm not accepting that pardon. I killed somebody and I'm worthy of death and I need to be killed like it says. I don't deserve a pardon. I don't want the pardon. I don't need the pardon. Leave me be. And so they went back and, and to the legal departments and tried to figure out, thinking, well, wait a minute, he's been pardoned. they got to let him free. It, it, it's free. And, and, and it actually, uh, George appealed it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court looked at it, the pardon, and they said, wait a minute. Okay, yes, he's been given a pardon, but the pardon has to be accepted. And see, he ended up not a accepting that pardon, and he ended up being put to death. We are all worthy of death. Now Christ has made the pardon. He's not president of the United States, but he is the supreme ruler of the universe. And he has provided a pardon for all of us, but we have to accept it. There's some people out there, they don't accept that pardon, do they? Redemption from sin, come on up worship team. Redemption from sin has been secured. Amen? Redemption from sin has been secured, but you must respond to the offer of grace. And then the question is, have you come to Christ for salvation? Have you been set free from the penalty of sin? 
If not, I urge you today to respond in repentance and faith in him. The opposite of faith is fear and doubt. Some people are fearful of coming to Christ. They're fearful of the consequences, but understand grace was free. Pardon was manifested to us. We are given the opportunity in our life. And sometimes people, they fall back into sin. There's a story I used to tell a lot when I preached on redemption. True story. I'll end with this story. True story in England. Preached by the name of Gordon. He was walking down the street one day and he saw a boy on the street with a couple of old barn birds in it. And the boy was poking and prodding the birds. And Gordon says, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just torturing these birds. When I get done with them, I'll kill them and put them away. They're just a couple old barn birds. And A.J. Gordon, he looked at the boy and he said, well, would you sell me the birds? And the boy said, no, nah, they're not worth anything. You don't want these birds. I'll just have fun with them for a while. And A.J. Gordon said, but I'll pay the price. What will you sell them for? And they settled on a price. And A.J. Gordon took that bird cage and he held it up, he bought those birds, and he opened the door, and he let those birds go free. We today have been in a bird cage. We've been in slavery. We've been in chains. Some of you have been chained by the addictions in your life that have brought you down so low it's unbelievable. But I can tell you today, on the cross, he didn't make you come to him, but he opened the door. He opened the door where you can come to him. Amen. Bible says, no man comes with the Father but by me. He opened the door. And what's really amazing about that is some of you here today, maybe some of you here today, see that the door is open and you choose to stay in. You choose to stay in the cage. I don't understand that. Does it, does it make any sense to you, Willie? No. Makes no sense other than, you know, there's a song we sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. Maybe there's some people in that cage that are blind that don't see the door. Amen. You can preach about the door. That doesn't mean they necessarily see it. But there is a door. There is a way out of your mess. Amen. And it's through Jesus Christ. Amen. Him crucified. Him rose from the dead. Could we stand? While they're playing us, uh, singing a song, this altar's open. Amen. Some of you just need a renewing.
just wandering around the store picking out candy. The lady at the register asked if they were my kids and I found out that they were abandoned at the Circle K by their parents. Please, please pray that they end up safe with a responsible family member to share the part of the as I was leaving. It was so sad. There's a lot of stuff like that that happens every day. Sometimes we just don't realize how privileged we are to be here. Amen. And worshiping God. Hallelujah. 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 Let's sing this song. Bless the Lord on my soul. The altar's still open.
that word. song we started the service with. And we'll close on that. I'm redeemed. Yeah, they, they flat, I think it was. They flat. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. By love. There we go. By love divine. Bye. 